eh, eh, yo siempre empiezo con... Uh, sí, primero, uh, ¿alguien tiene algún problema con el Spanish? Uh, ¿Alguien no comprende nada de castellano? ¿Anything about languages? No? No. ¿Alguien no conoce Java y Usas Group? ¿Es la primera vez que viene o algo similar? Oh, ¿Quién nos ha engañado? ¿Por qué? Pues, eh, ¿alguna vez? ¿Estás convencido de que nos ha engañado ahí? ¿Sí? <risa> pues, pues esperamos que, que, que repitáis, a ver, si, a ver si os parece interesante esta, esta charla de Matthew. Eh, hoy hacemos una de estas charlas que son básicamente de, de one to one, por decirlo así. Eh, pero tenemos otros formatos que seguramente sean igual de interesantes, como catas y eh, workshops y otro tipo de, de historias. ¿okay? Así que, esto, esto es una cosa más que nada de, de, de ir bien. Entonces, para los que no nos conozcáis, es la intro tradicional. Eh, necesitaré a alguien que me ayude con lo de siempre, porque nunca me acuerdo las cosas que digo y parece que nadie se acuerda nunca. Pero bueno, eh, es, es, somos una, una, una comunidad de gente interesada en la tecnología. Básicamente estamos focalizados en Java. Y siempre estamos buscando, eh, abiertos a, disputar, a discutir, a hablar, sobre tecnología, servicios, cualquier tipo de framework. Hoy tenemos un ejemplo, por ejemplo. Y somos gente curiosa, básicamente. Curiosa sobre tecnología. Alguien habla por ahí de escala, y Java 8, y esas cosas. Alguien tengo que engañar por aquí sobre eso. Eh, ¿Qué es lo que hacemos? Pues nos reunimos, eh, hablamos, lo he dicho, evaluamos productos, sugerencias, iniciativas, y básicamente intentamos hacer que la comunidad de desarrolladores aquí crezca. Pues somos pocos, pero normalmente en los eventos solemos ser como de 50. Así que hoy supongo que todo el mundo está pendiente de, de cómo será el nuevo rey. <risa> eh, pero bueno, básicamente lo que hacemos es, es enfocarnos sobre cosas de la tecnología, pero no solo relacionadas con Java. Aquí siempre pongo relacionadas con Java, pero no solo de Java vive, vive el hombre. Eh, y luego buscamos pues, gente como vosotros, gente que sea open minded, que, que sepa de lo que es la tecnología, de que pueda discutir sobre ideas, soluciones, propuestas inclusive pues algún que otro sponsor que tenemos a la cara de la búsqueda y de captura y algún que otro sitio por ejemplo hoy yo no sé igual un día de estos tenemos que conseguir ir a una ubicación en la que el proyector nos sirva los azules como son y los rojos como son porque realmente nos estamos teniendo muy buena suerte suerte y gratis es gratis ah gratis aquí es gratis de momento sí sí ahí está, ahí está. de momento no nos podemos quejar pero gachis la lástima que tengamos speakers ahí que saben de temas muy interesantes y que al final no se vean tan bonitas como nosotros, no tendrá de Ok, pues lo de siempre. Eh, tenemos unos cuantos enlaces que bien se ve todo, ¿eh? ¿Cómo nos habéis conocido? ¿Os puedo contar Meetup, seguro? Vale. Eh, hay, hay por aquí algún que otro enlace para que nos conozcáis. Tenemos comunidad en Google Plus, en, en Meetup, tenemos Twitter. Twitter es gratis. Entonces... Aquellos que queráis sois bienvenidos si queréis hacernos una mención de verdad que los que estamos con Twitter os agradeceremos. Y tenemos por ahí alguna foro de discusión, que hay de abajo que no lo veo, en Google Groups y el blog oficial donde vamos publicando los que hacemos, etc. Así que cualquier medio que queráis usar para comunicarnos es más que bienvenido. Um, hemos hecho eventos de todo tipo para los que nos conozcáis, hemos hablado de datos no relacionales, hemos hablado de servicios en la nube, hemos hablado de lenguajes que corren sobre la JVM, hemos hablado de. Bueno, de frameworks web, de Java 8, de, de frameworks de um, Spring, frameworks de Independence Injection y mucho más. Play, vaya, otro framework de desarrollo de APIs y tal. Y algunos más que seguro que nos dejamos en el tintero porque cada mes solemos hacer una media de dos eventos. Así que, bueno, echarle un ojo por ahí si queréis al blog o lo que sea. De eventos siguientes que siempre suelo hacerlo así, por, por comodidad, de que la gente que venís aquí tenéis el privilegio de saber cuál va a ser el siguiente evento, así que. Ya sabéis que luego va a venir, la semana que viene vamos a hacer una, una demo camp con la gente de Eclipse. Y una demo camp, para el que no lo sepa, es básicamente un evento informal en la que bueno, pues intentamos ver qué novedades aporta eh, determinadas soluciones, en este caso Eclipse, y qué ventajas ofrecen las nuevas versiones para el desarrollador. Entonces será un evento informal en el que hablaremos un poco qué hay de nuevo en Eclipse, qué cosas son bonitas, qué no, qué novedades hay sobre el Java 8, si es que hay alguna. Y básicamente intentaremos hacer alguna demo a ver si entre nosotros podemos ver qué cosas hemos conseguido hacer y no y demás. 
eh, la gente de Clip está por la labor y de patrocinar por estas cosas, pero necesitamos, sobre todo necesitamos, como es algo informal y tal, necesitamos ponerles una especie de guión, necesitamos a gente que nos diga, oye, pues yo me puedo encargar de mirar esto de Clip y hacer alguna prueba y este tipo de cosas, porque al final no, no se trata de que venga alguien y nos haga una charla magistral, sino que sea algo colaborativo y diga, ah, mira, pues yo voy a mirarme esto, a ver si esto nuevo de Clip me sirve para no sé qué y puedo hacer ese tipo de, de cosas. Así que... Bueno, básicamente esto es que os necesitamos nosotros, ¿vale? Para que nos echéis una mano y si queréis llevar este evento adelante y os queréis animar, pues eh, echarle un ojo a la última versión de Eclipse, Eclipse Luna, y, y, y venid el, el sábado o el viernes que viene, creo que es, y echarle un ojo y jugaremos con Eclipse a ver qué tal, qué tal se nos da. ¿Vale? Y creo que ya está, tenemos varias propuestas ahí en el tintero, ya para julio tenemos alguna cosa, ya creo que es Will Fly, el siguiente que tenemos en el no se lo eh, que son las aplicaciones que todo el mundo seguro que se acordará de JBoss pues eh, WillFly es el siguiente o la versión digamos eh, cambiada y ya no hay más para septiembre, octubre, etc. y alguna que otra que se nos escapará pero bueno, básicamente hay por ahí algunas tecnologías de OGI que seguro que son interesantes y más de uno por aquí que defiende a muerte porque no mira nada y bueno, y sobre todo la pregunta de abajo, que, que nos hagáis llegar a saber qué es lo que os motiva más, qué tipo de tecnologías, qué cosas creéis que son las más interesantes. Yo siempre os digo que, por favor, hacednos saber qué es la, qué es la siguiente cosa que, que os gustaría ver aquí. Eh, pero una vez más, como os decía, eh, bienvenido. Eh, lo, lo más importante aquí es que nos digáis de nuevo qué es lo que que es lo que os gustaría, o sea, que por favor decidnos, oye, esto es la, la, la siguiente tecnología, me gustaría una charla sobre esto, me gustaría hacer un workshop sobre lo otro, o me gustaría que esta gente que conozco nos haga, nos haga que una demo ya. Estaba la gente de WS2 por aquí, un middleware de integración y tal, y alguien me dijo, oye, pues sería bueno hacer una charla. Al final no hemos conseguido, no hemos conseguido con ellos tener esa charla en estas fechas, pero quizás a posteriori en otros, en otros meses lo consigamos. Eh, pero de nuevo vuelvo a este señor, que lo que quiero haceros ver es que esto se trata de que no vayamos haciendo otros push, sino que lo hagáis haciendo vosotros, y nos hagáis saber qué es lo que, qué es lo que os gustaría hacer. Y nada más, si tenemos algo más tiempo más activo, así que un pues, saludo a todos, pues, estoy con nosotros, eh, nos da el adiós, pero no, en serio. Eh, uniros a la comunidad, juntaros, eh, comentar lo que os parezca más útil, más interesante, y, y, y por último, eh, daros las gracias al más a los nuevos que habéis llegado porque pues, eh, espero que podáis repetir y que os motive. Pues, vamos a ver si conseguimos cambiar el color de esto. Y yo ya me callo porque si no, no paro de hablar. Eh, darle las gracias, por supuesto, a Iván y a Matthew por la propuesta de la charla de hoy. Eh, ellos son ingenieros de Yahoo Labs y eh, son los responsables de eh, Bookkeeper. Y bueno, creo que por ese lado. Así que gracias a vosotros por venir y gracias a Matthew y a Iván por venirlo. Y os dejo con
uh, consistency. This kind of issues that we can face at Yahoo on a large scale. And this presentation is about Apache Bookkeeper, which is one of the projects uh, we are involved in. So yeah, uh, Ivan is a committer, and I am a contributor and a user. So I'll be I'll be doing uh, the I'll be talking all the time. But if there are questions, uh, Ivan can also uh, chime in if it's very uh, technical or since he knows also the system very well. And the, the talk is about one hour long. But if you have questions, don't hesitate. All right. So topic is building reliable systems with uh, this system, which is called the Apache Bookkeeper. Uh, indeed, building distributed systems is quite difficult. It's quite difficult to get right. So this is a word cloud that was generated from one of the uh, documentation pages of uh, Bookkeeper. So we can see quite uh, a few issues related to uh, to what we have to deal with in distributed systems, and uh, some of them are, for example, uh, fault tolerance and recovery. Because indeed, uh, we have to expect failures in distributed systems. They will happen, and they are bound to happen. So if we look at a, suppose this is a set of uh, machines and um, or servers that we have, uh, the vendors will tell you, for example for this, they will tell you, well, it's less than one person annual failure rate, but in reality, it's a lot more. And some uh, studies that, so they take practical cases, and you can see up to 10% uh, uh, failure rate uh, per year. So that means if you have several thousand uh, servers, you can expect that one of them will fail every day. So I think it's an automatic mode for some reason. Let me just uh, see if we can fix that. I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, the other issue is that the network is not reliable. So we will have failures and we have issues with the network. In particular, some messages may be lost. Um, so. Uh, due to failures and issues with the network, uh, we have a series of problems that we have to deal with uh, when designing and developing distributed systems. So let's look a bit at some of the symptoms. And by no means is that an exhaustive list of the symptoms, but uh, let's have a look and then we'll see at how to uh, solve them. So suppose uh, we have a client talking to a server. Uh, the first problem will be that uh, we, the server might crash, so then it's, we're not able to communicate with it. The other issue might be that the network uh, might lose messages, like we might lose messaging when communicating. And actually, it's impossible to distinguish, to distinguish between uh, losing messaging on the network and crashing. Um, so uh, what we do usually is we replicate the service that uh, we are uh, dealing with, so that if we can't uh, have a communicate with the endpoint, then we have uh, a second a replica that we can talk to. But then, that is fine when we don't have a state in the server. The server is stateless, at excellent, we can just replicate ad infinitum, and things will be fine. But the problem is when we have state. And when we have state, uh, we might get some inconsistencies. And what does that mean? That means that uh, it's, it's very hard to keep things in sync. So we're not guaranteed that what we will read talking to the replica or the other instance of the service will be actually the last thing that was written. And the problem gets worse where there is a multiple clients. <clears throat> so this uh, problem was actually formalized in uh, around 2000 by uh, somebody who was uh, head of Intomy, which is a search engine, also Professor Berkeley, he's called Eric Bruber. And so in 2000 he said, well, we, he exposed this conjecture, which is uh, in distributed, well, okay, in distributed systems, uh, we'll have failures. And then if we want to have a distributed system and be able to deal with failures, then we have to make a trade-off between being consistent or being available. 
And so there's this uh, famous speaker from uh, Amazon, uh, from which comes uh, uh, Cassandra, which proposes a model to deal uh, to deal with such issues, and it says, okay, in our system, and that doesn't work for all systems, but in some systems, it is okay to lose some consistency because we don't want to uh, lose availability. We want the service to be always running. So that's me. What does that mean? That means that if, for some reason, you can't communicate to all of the nodes, but at least the nodes you, you are able to communicate with, uh, they will answer and they will keep working. Obviously, this has some impact uh, on the consistency, which is uh, the point of uh, the conjecture. And uh, you will have to be uh, aware of that, that uh, things will not be completely in sync and the things will be eventually consistent. So, or, I mean, it can be, and then you can have some uh, protocols for reconciliating some of the issues, some of the, uh, some of the data, but at least you have to, to be aware of that. And that means you are trading off consistency for availability. On the other hand, some other systems, so we don't see that well, but uh, they, they don't uh, want to lose consistency. So that means that, uh, so I'm mentioning Zookeeper and Bookkeeper. Zookeeper is a coordination system, we'll be talking about uh, it later. And if we lose some nodes in, in, the, in the system, we might be able to uh, handle that. We might be able to keep being uh, keep having consistent uh, uh, operations up to a limit. Then it depends how many nodes, which nodes. But in, a, in no case will we uh, uh, trade consistency for availability. And that means that if we see that uh, the system we're losing too many nodes, for example, we just stop operating. So we're not available. And uh, so this is two uh, key issues, availability and consistency, due to failures and distributed systems, but there are actually more issues. And uh, we just look at, at a few of them because they're important, and uh, we actually address some of them in Bookkeeper or through uh, Bookkeeper. The first one is the problem with split brain. So what is split brain? Usually in the service systems, it's a good thing to have a mastership on some uh, some of the data or some, uh, so we organize into two subsystems and then we say, okay, uh, we divide the data space into multiple partitions and then we say, okay, you will be responsible for uh, a given partition, we assign mastership. So let's say here, for example, we have partition A, so unfortunately it's really difficult to see, but uh, what is going on is that, uh, oops, So we have a, a writer. This writer is responsible for all the operations on question A. And he writes to, uh, to multiple services. And what may happen is that suddenly this, uh, this process, it stops responding. That could be, for example, in Java, a long uh, garbage collection pose. And in that case, the system might detect that will work. I mean, it's a, if it's a distributed system, usually you want to detect that. And what will happen is that you will provision automatically a new master for that partition. So you have a new writer in this case, and the writer, writer A prime. But now the writer A that was doing something else and unresponsive comes back into the system and it starts issuing the buffered operations that it had. And so that's the problem of split brain. We actually have two processes that think they are responsible for a thing, for a partition, of which only one should be uh, responsible. So that's a problem that will affect uh, consistency. Um, another problem is failure detection. As I mentioned before, it's impossible to distinguish between a network failure, like if you lose messages to communicate with a node, maybe it's because the node is down, maybe it's because the network is, is, is down, it's really hard to know. So, uh, and it's worse, maybe A, so A can talk to C, but B cannot talk to C. So, it's we have to be able to detect that this is a failure and to decide on that. I will see some solutions for that. 
And then, uh, last problem I want to talk about is the problem of recovery, because when we have a failure, well, we want to have a protocol to recover. It means that usually we want to replace the node that was down, and we want, for that, usually we need a recovery protocol. And if we need to recover to a consistent state, then we need to be able to recover from consistent data. And that's really what Bookkeeper is about, and how Bookkeeper can help in the context of the service systems. Indeed, let's look at some of the solutions for these problems. So, the general approach is that for a given system, we need to uh, design techniques that are specific to the system. But for that, we have to rely on some guarantees. Uh, one example of a guarantee is writing to disk. If you just say, I write to disk, well, actually you have no guarantee that the system has written to the physical storage. For that, if you want that guarantee, you need to flush the disk. And so uh, that's one of the guarantees, but some of the guarantees in the context uh, when, the, when there is multiple um, processes already that put your multiple nodes, we need to use protocols in order to, uh, to reach uh, guarantees, for example, uh, consensus. Uh, and the good thing is that uh, we can use some tools or building block in order to design specific techniques for our system. And so we'll see some of them, and Bookkeeper is actually one of those uh, building blocks. So let's have a look at uh, some typical techniques for, uh, for handling some of the problems that I mentioned. Um, one is replicating. So we have a service, we need to replicate it, and the service is operating. So. Uh, I talk first about active replication. Active replication, what is it? It's uh, uh, what we do is actually from a client, we will issue uh, operations to two instances of the same service. So they work and they are both active, so they both compute the changes that are associated to the uh, uh, operations that are issued by the client. Uh, and so if one of them fails, well, the other is immediately able to. Uh, take over and uh, respond and the service is available. One problem with that is that uh, you need, like if it's computationally intensive, you need twice the number of resources. And then, uh, in addition, uh, if, if you have non-deterministic operations, like operations that involve uh, some randomization, or things related to the time, in particular if uh, the system is multi-threaded, then uh, both uh, of these nodes, of these instances of the service, might actually diverge. And so you have active um, uh, nodes which are diverging, so that might not be what you, what you actually want. Another technique is called uh, primary backup. In primary backup, we have an active node and a standby node. Uh, the, what you do as a client, you pass uh, request operations to the active node. The active node it computes the result, passes to the standby node, uh, receives the acknowledgement from the standby node, so it knows, okay, it is passed to the standby node, and then it applies the operations locally and passes back to the, to the client. So that means that if there is a failure of the active node, well, the standby node is already, it just suddenly it, it can become active and it already has the state uh, that it was building by uh, replicating the operation from the active. And we don't have the problem of determinism. So that's uh, one technique. In general, the more, if you want to uh, tolerate failures, especially on data, the more replicas, uh, the more uh, failures you will be able to the more than pressure concurrent failures, right? And also in that case, uh, if you replicate three times, you will be able to tolerate uh, two failures concurrently. Uh, but actually, you don't need to, to replicate, if you have an ensemble of nodes, you don't need to replicate to all of the nodes. You can use what's called worms. So let's say you have an ensemble of three nodes, you can actually replicate to a quorum of two nodes. And you have 
three quorums of two nodes in this case. Uh, and so you can use this technique. So you still have a replication, but you don't, you're not writing to all of the nodes of the system. And in this case, it's an interesting uh, property because we have uh, majority quorums, which can give uh, some properties for consistency. <coughs> Uh, although a bookkeeper does not need a uh, majority quorums. So let's see one interesting bending block that we can use for this distributed system. And that is also used by a bookkeeper, which is zookeeper. So Apache zookeeper, oops, sorry. Apache uh, zookeeper, uh, the name comes from the the motto is, it says that uh, because distributed systems are like a zoo, so it's, uh, it's quite complex to manage and you need somebody to coordinate the system. That's what uh, Zookeeper is about. So Zookeeper, what is it? What it is, it's a centralized coordination service uh, that provides uh, services such as uh, configuration, uh, things uh, related to uh, synchronization in a distributed context. Uh, you can use it for detecting failures and doing things like leader election and, and membership. And so it works as a centralized service, but it is also a distributed service that is tolerant to failures. And it is uh, reliable. Uh, what it can be seen as a distributed data store that uh, provides some uh, guarantees about what, uh, when you write, what you can read, the ordering of uh, the operations, and this is all provided through a consensus protocol, um, which is a bit similar to Paxos, if you know it, and it's called ZAP, which stands for Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast. So it gives the gar uh, guarantees about uh, the consistency of the operations, and even in the presence of uh, some failures. So in this case, it, uh, for example, it, then it's a question of quorum. You, you can decide how many failures you can tolerate based on how many uh, machines are in the Zookeeper uh, ensemble. And so since it's reliable, it provides those services, well, you can use it as a source of proof for your system. And one example of using it as a source of truth is for failure detection. So I mentioned before, it's really hard to know whether there is a failure because sometimes uh, this component can to, to this one, but this one cannot. So has it failed or not? Is it a network issue? Is it a, well, what do you do about that? So what you can what you can do is that you can just rely on Zookeeper as a source of proof and Zookeeper will detect. So it, what it does is, is maintain uh, connections and things which are called ephemeral nodes. And if it loses the connection with a particular node, it can consider it as dead. And if uh, Zookeeper considers it as uh, dead, then you can say, okay, in my system, this particular node is dead, and so this is the source of truth, and then you can trigger some uh, reorganization of the cluster. And all the other participants will get a notification that this particular node is considered as dead. And so when you have a dead node, usually <coughs> what you want to do is actually recover. So here, uh, so let's say this node is dead, uh, or has been detected as such by Zookeeper. So what will happen is we will trigger a record configuration. What does that mean? There are four steps. Four. And one, we need to find it. Uh, so, so I'm sorry about the colors, but so this node is outside of. It's a, it's a new one that you can either provision a new node or uh, acquire it from a, a, a pool of nodes that you have available. The second thing will be to fetch. Uh, the data in order to third rebuild uh, the state, and then when you have a replacement for the fail node, you can join the ensemble. You need to coordinate to a particular protocol. And one uh, fundamental requirement for being able to recover from failures is actually to be able to read uh, 
data. Uh, and well, in that case, you have durability of the data. So, <clears throat> like in this case, for example, sorry, uh, we're reading from there and there, like we have partially replicated things, and we need to be able to read from there. And so, we need data to be durable so that we can derive fair. One way in general uh, to have durability is to image. So, you can any update to the state of the system, you take a snapshot, but that's not very efficient. So another way is to do to use a draw. So draw, what you do is you write mutations of the state to a draw. So a draw is a sequence of mutations that you can store physically on this. And uh, usually you would write the since it's sequential, it can be quite efficient for uh, when using mechanical drives, right? So concretely, actually, we can use this particular technique of journaling in things like write-to-head logging. So databases actually use that quite a lot, or for things like durable messages, messaging. And uh, the step, they say this works fine on a given node, on a, a one host. But actually, when you have a distributed system, you'd like to use the same uh, the same technique, but in the distributed context. And that's exactly what the Apache Bookkeeper is about. It provides reliable distributed storage. Oh, in that case, sorry, reliable distributed logging. Uh, and uh, the log as a sequence of mutations. And uh, so it's a, it provides a durability service. It works on community hardware, provides durability, and then uh, it provides things like replication. Uh, the other things we can't see uh, is uh, uh, consistency and uh, uh, mechanisms for recovering uh, from the log. Uh, and you can use it through a user library. So really we can use it as a building block for building reliable systems. Just as we can use Zookeeper to have, uh, to, to have a source of truth and to coordinate the system, we can use Bookkeeper as a durability service. So it provides the ledger abstraction. So it's really, we have a log, and uh, we have a log, we add operations and any things. So in, in Bookkeeper, actually, it's uh, arrays of bytes of arbitrary length, anything. Uh, we add to the log, we can read from the log, and we can also checkpoint. So that's, that would be the log, and actually the abstraction that is used in Bookkeeper is a set in segments of the log, which are called the ledgers. So we can have uh, multiple ledgers, and uh, we can uh, check points. So it would be, for example, we take a snapshot of the state at some point, uh, we keep it somewhere, and then that means that if there is a failure, what we have to do is just read from the snapshot apply the pending operations that were in the log, in the ledger, and then we're uh, good to go. <clears throat> One important thing uh, that uh, Bookkeeper does is it provides some guarantees. So there's two main guarantees. The guarantees are the consistency and uh, durability. So the guarantee about this, uh, sorry. The guarantee about uh, durability is that if an entry has been accurate, so you write an entry to the bookkeeper system, if it says OK, then it means that the entry is there and you will be able to access it. And the other thing is that if somebody manages to read an entry, then everyone will be able to see the entry. So that's the gar uh, consistency guarantee. So it sounds like simple guarantees, but actually they are quite hard to uh, to obtain in the distributed context, and there is quite a few corner cases. So we'll actually look at a few of them. Uh, uh, yeah. But the important thing is that we have guarantees about durability and consistency. Let's have a look a bit at the history of uh, Bookkeeper to put things in context. So the initial use, so in Yahoo, we use Hadoop quite a lot. Hadoop at the of Hadoop is the Hadoop file system. In the Hadoop file system, it uh, replicates uh, 
blocks of data onto multiple hosts. Actually, this uh, it replicates a given block onto three different uh, machines. And uh, there is a particular piece of the Hadoop infrastructure which keeps track of uh, where the blocks are allocated. And uh, when we talk about the Hadoop cluster, it can be thousands of machines. And it's called the name node. And initially, the name node was not for tournament, like it was a single point of failure. And that was a problem because, okay, you can have the data safely uh, uh, stored on HDFS, but the system that uh, tells you where the things are, it is not reliable. So that was kind of a problem. And we could not use HDFS for, uh, for having um, a recovery since uh, the name of is actually the coordinator piece in the HDFS. So, Bookkeeper was originally designed for providing uh, journaling for the um, for the Hadoop name node, so that we could recover. And in 2008, it became an open source project. So uh, the Bookkeeper is actually was actually initiated by the same authors than uh, Zookeeper, and uh, it was open source in 2008 as a contribution of. Zookeeper then became a sub-project of Zookeeper, which means it has its own code base. And it's in production uh, since 2012. Uh, so I'll talk about some of the production use cases. But, and you might uh, have, if you have a look at the, the Bookkeeper um, pages, or the main list, you might see that there is not such uh, so much activity on the user group, uh, on the user group, but on the uh, development group, there is a lot of activity, especially from uh, people from these companies. Um, so not all use cases are public, but usually, if uh, some computers from a given company are actively involved in the development of the software, it's probably that they have an interest in it. So uh, computers mostly from these companies now. <clears throat> and um, now that was an overview. We had uh, we saw some of the problems uh, typical in the super system. Some ways to address them. Why we could uh, uh, maybe use Bookkeeper for solving some of them. But I will give some uh, use cases and, and concrete example of, of how to use Bookkeeper. But first, uh, let's have a look at uh, Bookkeeper itself. What's inside? And I think it's interesting because Bookkeeper itself is a distributed system and as such it has to deal with some of the issues with uh, distributed systems. So we'll see some of the solutions that it implements. First, let's have a look at the architecture. Uh, so we might uh, use Bookkeeper from a client system to a client library in Java. Uh, we use the ledger abstraction so when we add it, we create a ledger, we add entries to the ledger. Uh, so the entries, yeah, so therefore ledger entries. We might actually create multiple ledgers. And uh, we might have multiple clients to the system. One thing though, that for a given ledger, there is only one writer. <clears throat> and then uh, the storage nodes are called bookies. So a bookie is really a process that runs on a machine that has a, a storage disk. And what we do is we write uh, the ledger entries in a replicated fashion to the bookies. Uh, we have we maintain some kind of index to read more easily from uh, those nodes when we have to recover. And uh, we coordinate the system uh, through Zookeeper. So now we're going to look at uh, uh, how we write data to Bookkeeper and how we read data from Bookkeeper. So writing, um, <clears throat> let's say, so what, when we write entry, what we do is we replicate the entry on the bookies and we also use a technique which is called tracking. So that means that we write to a quorum of bookies, so let's say we have a quorum of two bookies out of an uh, ensemble of three, and we rotate the quorums. So we write first to the two first bookies, and the next entry, the yellow entry, we write to bookie two and three. And that's called 
scrapping, it's a technique to balance uh, the load uh, of the writes. Bookkeeper uh, provides reliable writes, and that's uh, one of the key properties uh, I mentioned before. It uses uh, quorums to write, so we have replication that is controlled. Well, we, ma we make sure that uh, data the, that we read is not corrupt by storing a digest along with each entry that we write. We make sure that the entries are correctly persisted to the list that they are on durable storage by doing a uh, flush for each entry before returning to the client. And uh, this is um, uh, related to the protocol that is used by a bookkeeper. We only acknowledge to the client, so the client uses uh, the API and it has entries. And at some point it will receive acknowledgement. When it receives an acknowledgement for a given entry in the ledger, that say entry 10. That means that all previous entries, sorry, all previous entries have been uh, acknowledged and this entry as well. So if you receive an acknowledgement for entry 10, it means that all entries from 0 to 10 are have been stored correctly in the bookkeeper and accepted by cores of uh, and correctly replicated. So now, uh, well, that's for writing, and that's for writing reliably. Let's have a look at how we read uh, data from Bookkeeper. So we use the API. The API says uh, we read from a given ledger. So you can read a range of entries. You can read a particular entry. And you ask the bookie, I want the entry yellow. OK. It gives it to you. If it doesn't have it, uh, then you can find it on another bookie. Then I mentioned some chronic cases, like uh, how to ensure consistencies uh, in, uh, in all cases. Uh, for example, we may have partial writes. So uh, maybe, so we write to quorums, but, and now somebody is reading from a given ledger. Okay, so I'm really, I want this entry, so you, you might read entry yellow, but actually, you, have, you don't know if entry yellow has been correctly replicated to other nodes. So you don't know if the quorum has been reached, and you may not have been reached. So that, that would be an inconsistent read. And, uh, and so this is something we have to handle. And what we do, what we need, is a way to make sure that when we read an entry, it has been correctly uh, uh, replicated. So how do we do that? We need some kind of consensus on uh, the entries that uh, we write and that we read. So that we, when an entry has been saved as written, well, we can check and uh, we actually are able to read it. So for that, we can use Zookeeper. Zookeeper provides uh, the guarantees about, uh, so it uses a process protocol, and uh, we can, what we can do is, for each entry that uh, we write, so let's say we have a writer there. So he writes entries, and let's say we first wrote this one, and then we wrote this one. And so what we can say is, okay, I've written this one. I'm writing to Zookeeper that this entry has been correctly replicated because I received the acknowledgement. Okay. And so the reader will open the ledger for reading and will say, I want this entry. It will say, ah, oh, this entry has been correctly replicated. That's fine. But that's not very efficient. Like if we do that for all entries, that's not efficient. So what we can do is we can use batching. Uh, so batching is a, is a classical technique to improve performance in uh, such systems. But uh, and what we do here is actually the batch is the whole ledger. So as I, as I mentioned, the log is composed of segments, and segments are uh, ledgers. And uh, what we do is uh, we when we close a given ledger. We actually write the last conference entry. But then, so that means that if I want to read data, I open the ledger, uh, a ledger that has been closed, and I can check what is the last the, uh, thing confirmed, and I know everything I read until there has been correctly stored. So that's also a guarantee that I can rely upon. Obviously, there is a problem if uh, the ledger that is writing data crashes. And in that case, 
we don't know what is the last confirmed entry. It's not in Zookeeper because it was not closed properly. So what we need to do is uh, start a recovery process. And that means finding what is the last confirmed entry so that reads will be consistent. Uh, so we could read, uh, start writing from zero and, uh, and find, uh, read the whole ledger sequentially. But the ledger can be, I don't know, megabytes, gigabytes, and megabytes. So that might be not very efficient. So what we do is we actually piggyback um, some, uh, the last, so each time you, we do a write, we piggyback the last one that was confirmed onto the bookies. So now, if we want to recover the, the ledger, we just have to ask, OK, uh, what was the last I confirmed? OK, from there, I can read and recover uh, only from there. I don't have to read the whole thing. Another uh, problem that we address in Bookkeeper, I mentioned before the problem of split brain. So the split brain problem was that was when we, in the case of Bookkeeper, we have a single writer for a given ledger. We only use one writer. One writer. The problem would be that if we have multiple writers suddenly for a given ledger. And that would be the problem of split brain. So again, we don't see very well. But uh, say we have a writer here. It is originally the writer for a given ledger in my state. And suddenly it enters the pose or is not responsive. This is detected by Zookeeper. Zookeeper says, OK, uh, we trigger an update uh, reconfiguration of the system. A new writer comes in and takes ownership of this ledger. It starts writing things onto the ledger. And then the old writer comes in. Like, because it was not dead, actually. It was, it was decided that it was dead from the beeper, but it was not dead. So it has some buffer entries. And, what have, and so it might, if, if we have only two writers that would break the, uh, the protocol in, in Bookkeeper, that would mean we have inconsistent uh, data. And for that, what we do is we use something which is called fencing. So fencing is a technique to prevent this problem of split breaks, of having multiple uh, processes that think they are responsible for a particular thing in the system. We use fencing, and it means that we say, no, uh, I am, so this guy, what he will say, he will say, I am uh, the new writer. It informs the bookies that this is the new writer for that particular ledger. And so when the other one comes in and starts uh, sending the buffered operations, they will all error. That, again, that prevent, that's a technique that uh, prevents uh, inconsistencies. Okay, um, so I'll talk a bit now of, so I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about the, the, the system uh, of uh, the distributed aspects of uh, Bookkeeper, but it might also be interesting uh, to see what's inside of a bookie. So one of those storage was how can we uh, store the data efficiently and how can we also read uh, from uh, those bookies efficiently and so uh, in the bookie so we have a log of uh, sequential entries and uh, <clears throat> that means that physically on the, on the disk it's a file with all the entries from multiple ledgers and since there is replication and striping and multiple lectures and multiple clients, those entries are all, they are sequential, but they are interleaved. Like, for example, the white is one ledger, the, the yellow there is another ledger, and we can see we have one, two, and four because of uh, the striping. So that means uh, when uh, we read, so Concretely, when we write to, when we add an entry to a given bookie, so what we do is we flush to disk so that we are sure the data is on physical storage. As a result, we have a sequence of interleaved entries, and then once we have flushed an entry, we hack. Okay, so that's one hack from a bookie. But the problem that's fine for writing. Especially, uh, that's a good property to have uh, sequential uh, writes on mechanical disks. Uh, on this SD, it's not too uh, obvious, but on mechanical drives, it's very interesting to have uh, this uh, scheme. 
Uh, it's okay for writing, but the problem is that if you want to read, when we have a recovery, for example, if we want to recover uh, the ledger 2 here, well, uh, that means that we have to scan the file and that will interfere with uh, actually the writes, so that will uh, harm the performance of, of the system. The writes will take longer to acknowledge, and overall the system will not be very efficient. So what do we do? Uh, in Bookkeeper, we separate the writes on the given uh, bookie with the reads. So we have two separate devices, and actually we use two separate disks uh, for that purpose. Uh, so we still have, when we add an entry, we still write it and make sure it is uh, written to uh, durable storage by flashing the entry. And we do this synchronously before hacking. But what we do is also we use another device, and here we write asynchronously the entry to uh, uh, another part of the system, which has a cache. And so we write the entry to the cache, which is more, so we write, what we call that is, so we write it to the ledger device, and we write it into something which we call the entry log. So we have the journal that makes sure things are there, like <coughs> durable, by syncing uh, synchronously. And we have the ledger device where we put the entries, and it's kind of a cache, so it maintains an index, and we can reorganize the things so that uh, from time to time, when the buffer is filling up, we can flush that to this. And then what we have is a, like, we can reorder the entries as well, and we have an index. So when we read things from the bookies, we can, instead of scanning the journal, what we do is, uh, well, we ask the index, I want to read the, the entries uh, from that ledger. Well, it will tell you, it will tell us directly where they are, and so we can, uh, th there will be, this will be much more efficient for reading. And this will not harm the performance of uh, the uh, the itself. So in terms of uh, performance, that's, uh, so that's from a given system that uh, we have, and this system has a constant write throughput. So we constantly write uh, to the system, not that much, but Wait, quite a bit. So it's this is this is uh, in this case these are uh, hard drives, and the maximum usually the maximum number of I/O per second that we can do is 120. Um, uh, we have on the journal. This is the journal device, and this is the ledger device. So what we can see is that the journal device has a pretty constant rate because for each entry we flush. So we make it a very small buffer for efficiency, but more. Pretty much every entry is synced to, to this. It's constant right there. And the ledger device is a lot less uh, operations per second. Why? Because it maintains a buffer and then flashes asynchronously. But we can see uh, in terms of throughput in here, so the throughput is not very really high because the, in this particular system the entries are very small. Um, but it's constant here. And here we can see those. Uh, Spikes. So those spikes are related to maintenance activity of the bookings. Um, so maintenance activity. So we have a system that is constantly writing data to disk, and if we do that all the time, like uh, megabytes per second, uh, well, we might have a problem with filling up the disk, and uh, maybe we don't need all that data. So what we do is we have processes for garbage collection and compaction. Uh, let me explain that uh, uh, in a bit, in, like here. Um, so we have, again, the, the journal and the entry log. Both we use a separate disk for both in order to uh, have better performance. Uh, normally, what we do is write the entry to the journal sequentially, then we can have some entries that we organize in memory, and then <coughs> we, uh, from time to time, we flush some of these to disk on the entry log. But that means that when entries have been persisted there, well, actually, that that's a point in the log, in the journal, sorry, 
So in this point, everything before has been actually persisted to disk and the interlock and the interlock. That's a, a, a point that we can take advantage of and we can say, okay, we can get rid of all that data there. So it's supposed to be done. Right? But, uh, so we can get, actually we can delete all these older entries and so that will clean up uh, some of the disk. So that's for the journal, that's how we clean up the journal. But now for the entry lab, what happens? So we can't remove these entries for now because somebody might want to read uh, from these uh, letters. What, uh, so we have to wait for uh, a deletion. Let's say letter one is deleted, so letter one is these, these entries there. And if it has been deleted, then what we can do is, uh, so that's a process that we trigger by default, I think, every hour. Um, what we do is we have a process that runs every hour, and then we copy the files here, remove those entries from the ledgers that have been deleted, and then we have a new file, and we can delete that one, and again, that, uh, can, this is kind of a compaction. And that explains, uh, so these run every hour more or less. So, <clears throat> uh, so we've seen some of the problems that, oh, sorry, that Bookkeeper is for. We've seen how it works inside. And now let's uh, see how we can use it to build reliable systems as a building ground. Again, uh, we have these uh, guarantees about uh, the consistency and the durability of the data that we write to Bookkeeper. Uh, we use Bookkeeper through a Java API. So, uh, we have uh, one uh, class which is Bookkeeper, which allows us to create ledgers. And the other uh, main class is, as, as a client product, from the current point of view, is the ledger handle, which allows us to add entries and read entries from a given ledger. Uh, the thing is, uh, the most important part of the API is that uh, all these operations are asynchronous. So we provide an asynchronous API for all these operations. Uh, and actually, the whole system, like Bookkeeper everywhere, it is implemented and using uh, asynchronous methods with callbacks in order to improve the, the to maximize the throughput of, of the system. <clears throat> so let's look at the, the tech stack is actually quite simple. Uh, we use Java, uh, we use Netty for the communication. So Netty uh, is quite efficient for asynchronous communication, plus it provides some guarantees about the ordering. And we use Zookeeper uh, for coordinating the system. Uh, before going into some specific use cases, I just want to say a word about uh, performance. So performance of Bookkeeper uh, is, I, so Bookkeeper is an IO bound system. So what it does is writes data to disk and through the network. So we are limited by both the disks and the network. So just to give an idea, so the mechanical drives are limited to 120 operations per second, and in SSD we have much more processor and it's much more efficient. But there is a, a it's still uh, quite more expensive. But anyway, so this this will be a limit in uh, in terms of uh, the maximum throughput that we can get with the disk, but we're also limited by the network. So just to give an example, on the gigabit network, uh, in theory we can get a bit more than, uh, than 100, but in practice it's, it would be 100 megabytes per, per second. If we have, if we're transmitting uh, 1 kilobyte messages, that means that uh, we'll only be able to send 100,000 messages per second per node. So that would be the limit because of the network. In, in this particular configuration. So, uh, uh, Bookkeeper is IO bound. We just have to know, understand a bit the limits uh, that we can get. This, these are physical limits. The good thing about Bookkeeper is that uh, for a given rate uh, of a bookie, how many uh, ads you can do per, per second? Well, the overall throughput is actually determined by 
the rate of the cookie uh, multiplied by the size of the ensemble divided by the chrome size. So, uh, because when, as I mentioned, when we write to Bookkeeper, we write to a core, which is a subset of nodes outside of an ensemble of nodes. So, a way to increase the throughput and to be more scalable is actually to simply increase the size of the ensemble. That's a very convenient way to scale out. That's assuming the ensemble parties and groups are on different networks. Sorry? So, only if the book is on different networks. No, actually, uh, I mean, uh, you might not be able, you might not send 100,000 messages of one kilobyte. I mean, uh, obviously, you will be limited by the network. So, and also, yeah, you want to say something? It's on separate network interfaces. If I'm playing throughput, we will try it. Okay, so some of the, I will start with some public use cases and uh, finish with more concrete example of how you can use a bookkeeper if you want durability. Um, I mentioned the Hadoop Pay node, uh, so that's what, uh, that was the initial use case for bookkeeper. This is actually used by QLA in production. Uh, then uh, HubSpot, which is uh, a big uh, online marketing company. They use Bookkeeper as a right to headlock for whatever systems they have. I don't know exactly the details, but that's a common use case. Uh, we've also built a, uh, a, a pub sub system with strong uh, uh, persist uh, persistency guarantees, which is called Hedvig. And Hedvig was actually designed originally for Peanuts. So Peanuts is also named Sherpa. It's a, a key value store that we use in Yahoo, which has some uh, kind of a uh, particular uh, model for consistency, but usually that is very low latency. And uh, at Yahoo scale, we need to be able to handle uh, failures of data centers. And that means we need some kind of replication across data centers. So uh, one of the initial use cases for Hedvig, which is a pop system built on top of Bookkeeper, uh, was for uh, cross-codal replication from Peanuts. Cross-codal is across the data center. Uh, we've also, I think there's a publication on the Yahoo Developer Network that talks about push notifications, how we use Bookkeeper uh, for providing uh, persistent updates to uh, multiple, like millions of consumer devices. And then we also use Bookkeeper for uh, cloud messaging in Yahoo, which is a, a broker that we have, uh, and it, it provides the reliability of the messages, and we use Bookkeeper for that. And again, there might be other use cases. We don't know of them. We know there are some uh, companies that also use them, but they haven't made public the, the use of, uh, uh, of this system. Uh, that's for the public use cases, and let's just look a bit at some of the concrete examples how we can use the bookkeeper in the system. So I mentioned before primary backup as a technique for uh, for handling failures of a given service, and one way was to have an active and a standby, and to pass the operations of the active to the standby. But actually, if you use bookkeeper, you can put bookkeeper in the middle, and you perform so a, a given client issues operations to uh, the active uh, node or service, whatever. The active service uh, computes the change, and what it does, it writes this change onto a uh, bookkeeper, onto like this distributed system, which provides uh, consistency and durability. And, and as long as it has received the acknowledgement, that's fine. It can Respond, it can apply the change itself to change its state and reply to the client. And the property that we get from there is that in this phase, well, the standby node, we can have a standby node that keeps stating the log, exactly like we do a tail on, 
analytics, we take the log, we read all the entries that have been applied by the active node, and continuously we sorry, we uh, we apply them to change our, our state. So that means that if the active fails, then the standby is almost immediately ready to take over uh, the role of the first the active node. So that's one way we can use Bookkeeper uh, for primary backup. We can use it uh, as a write ahead log for data stores. So these are supposed to be a different color than this one. But So this is Bookkeeper, and these are the bookies. And here you might have your data store, which is partitioned, and uh, uh, you have multiple nodes for serving the data. And you might use Bookkeeper as the, the right hand log. Actually, we have developed a system in Yahoo for uh, precisely this uh, this kind of data store and this kind of, of design. Sorry, um, where we keep uh, critical system metadata. So, system metadata. Why is it critical? Because let's say you lose uh, you lose some user data. Well, that's bad for some users, but maybe probably it's a minority of users, hopefully. But if you lose some system metadata, well, the whole system uh, will be uh, unavailable and will be down or will be inconsistent. Then that, this affects all users. That's why it's very important to have uh, a consistency and durability of system metadata. And that's why uh, we need the, uh, we, we can use uh, Bookkeeper for this kind of, uh, uh, of data. Uh, actually, we can use Bookkeeper for providing uh, durability for any kind of a distributed data structure. So there's a paper from uh, Microsoft uh, about a, a framework that they call Tango. And the conclusion of the paper, so Tango provides something very similar to Bookkeeper. And the conclusion of the paper is that I mean, as long as you have reliable distributed logging, well, any kind of data structure you can the easiest way, the easiest thing is like a, a distributed key value store. Uh, interestingly, we can also use Bookkeeper for not only for recovery but also for providing elasticity. So let's say we have a number of partitions in our system. Uh, here we have six partitions and they are currently on two nodes. And suddenly we say, oh no, uh, this is not enough for throughput that we have for the load that we have so we provision a new node and then uh, we, uh, we, re we rebalance the data so we are able to rebalance that and, and we can use Bookkeeper for that by using so what we do is we write the data that corresponds to uh, building the state of these partitions to Bookkeeper and simply when we need to provision a new host uh, we uh, we read from the log and the snapshots, and we just build the state, and we have elasticity in the system. And again, when uh, the database system that was mentioning that uh, we built for metadata, we will also use the exact same technique. And by the way, one uh, tool that might also be useful in this case, uh, if you want to trigger reconfigurations automatically, there is a system also in the Apache uh, uh, Foundation, which is, which is called Helix. Helix is built on top of Bookkeeper and is used by uh, LinkedIn, or is designed by LinkedIn. And you can actually uh, use that in coordination to Zookeeper as a source of truth, and use Helix as a, as a, a distributed state machine, and still have the durability with uh, Bookkeeper. So you can combine all these different building blocks to uh, build the complex system. And to finish, well, we can use uh, the bookkeeper library not only for a single system, but we can use it as a shared infrastructure. So different applications, uh, we simply use different ledgers and uh, there's no problem. So it's a better use of a given infrastructure. And that's it for this presentation. So mm, the so it's a diverse project, uh, the code base is available on GitHub and also on the Apache Gate. Uh, it's still a sub-project of Zookeeper, it should be a top-level Apache project uh, probably this year. Um, and it's
it's open to contributions. So if you're interested as a user or if you think uh, maybe you can bring a contribution, uh, well, please ask and uh, we'd be happy to have it. I have a happy design easy question, but uh, how easy is it to, to use Zookeeper or, or maybe sorry, Zookeeper to a kind of uh, legacy application and try to use as a Uh, so I'm not sure there is something specific about that. So uh, I don't think it, there is any dependency on the on the fact that the application might be a legacy application. As long as you start logging from that application to Bookkeeper, then you will you will be able to provide some recovery. Obviously, you need to implement how you exactly recover uh, uh, from failures. But, uh, a lot of people already have some kind of bug here. It's very trivial. Yeah. So one example was the name of it was actually they use the assumption that a lot of files files all over the place and that was actually very very difficult. But we also did a prototype with HTrace. So we did a very trace. So HTrace it uses a HTFS file system to do its uh, like a logging. And one of the problems is that it does, um, when a region server crashes, it needs to split the logs of that region server. It, doesn't, it puts all the logs from a single region server into a single big log file. So we, we did a prototype with bookkeeper for that, and that was actually fairly straightforward because you had to make all the same assumptions and uh, things like that. So really, it depends on the application, it depends how well you isolate your logging. Trying to move, you know, kind of an old system that doesn't work very well, writing logs and reading, and maybe works like this, can you know move in another direction and try to, you know, split all the information in the login and distributed system in the old way. I think I think one important thing is that if you don't have uh, a log for your application you won't be able to recover if there's a crash on the machine. Okay? So usually we use that even like the best is to use a log, and even better to use a distributed log, because then even a machine crash, even if you log to disk, well you're not guaranteed like you, the disk may crash, the, the machine may crash. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe we can we can use an uh, Log4j appender just to distribute our logging to Bookkeeper. Ah, but that, that would be a kind of a different logging. So I would qualify uh, log4j logging as a informative logs. Yeah. Whereas this is more uh, logs about the, the data of your system, like the changes of your system. Okay. So for example, a database. Uh, you would log all the transformations, all the the, okay. uh, the okay. transactions that you performed. Okay. Yeah. Now, now that you mentioned transactions, I I understand that uh, the client side of the of the bookkeeper is able to attach to an existing transaction, or how should that uh, work in case I have several parts of my application generating uh, some some events, some, some logs, and then the last of them, for some reason, requires a, a rollback or some, some kind of uh, undoing. Is that, is uh, that uh, supported? So, or, or so you're considering the fact when we, you start a, like a transaction, classical transaction in a database, uh -huh. you perform a series of operations, and then you try to commit or rollback. And you would like to use Zookeeper to be able to recover in case there is a, I, a I, crash I, in the middle. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, well, I'm just curious, um, uh, what's the, the best approach? Should there be several smaller uh, event logs in Bookkeeper or should Bookkeeper be uh, summarizing the whole set of different operations in the database? Yes, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. So one way, obviously, it would be like you, you 
pass all the operations to uh, a single component that will block the operations. Uh -huh. Okay, so that, like you say, you start the transaction and you assign a ledger to that transaction. So you write on that ledger all the operations for that given transaction. And so then you will be able to uh, to guarantee atomicity or depending on what exactly uh, the problem is you're trying to solve. But uh, otherwise, if you need multiple ledgers, then it might be a bit more tricky. In a, in a single database where you want to guarantee acidity and all across the whole database, you would generally use one log. Uh -huh. And basically, any mutation that comes into the database, you put it into the log first, and then even if the mutation fails, if, if the machine crashes, you just replay the log at that point on. So I think kind of what you're talking about is also a rollback log, it's a kind of different concept. This is okay. more for a recovery log. Uh -huh. but I, think, I think some of the... Uh, I think there is a, this logical database which is completely uh, um, based on the log concept, which is de-atomic. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not that, that familiar with that one. I was just uh, considering the situation where from the point of view of the user, the operation failed, mm -hmm. but part of the interaction with the database, or even with Bookkeeper, mm -hmm. succeeded. So Bookkeeper considers the action to be succeeded, but for some reason the, the operation failed, causing the database to roll back. So the, the actual state change didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But bookkeeper received and acknowledged. Well, what happens then if you replay that operation? It truly becomes a mistake. So if you replay it, it fails again. So it doesn't really matter if the bookkeeper has okay. it. It's in the log, but it fails. It will replay, co it will supposedly replay. causing the same crash. Yeah. I mean, okay. What's okay. important is that these operations, that they always arrive in the same order. Uh -huh. The order is the most important thing. So if it's the same machine and the events come in the same order and it's deterministic, then you will always end up with the same result, no matter how many times you play. If you have a, if you already have a cluster database, what would be the place of So, so it depends on the database. But for example, Ivan was mentioning like, in, uh, it can be used as the edit log for a database providing a record and log for the database. That's exactly what HBase does. HBase does use uh, a writer and log. And oh, I think you did a prototype to yeah. the end of the, that in the first. So you get this like low level leg field and distributed memory. Yeah. So and I showed some example like a very simple case would be a key value store. Mm -hmm. and all the changes that other persons are performing without them to bookkeeper and so you're able to recover if there's a problem. Yeah. You mentioned you have the event device the event device and the entry device, right? Yeah, the journal and device and the entry, the, uh, the ledger, uh, journal and ledger devices. One of them is for reading, yeah. right? and uh, what I uh, understood from the presentation is that it only keeps instances or keeps the same entries with both the machines. Yeah. <coughs> so, so what would it be uh, uh, redundant? Uh, it is redundant, but, uh, but when is uh, in the journal device? Uh, where, when is the data access? So what, what we do, so we have to consider that we're constantly writing to the bookies, okay? It can be really a very high throughput. And we, the, the fundamental guarantee that we want is that the data is safely stored in this. So we need something like a journal. But the way we keep the entries there is not very optimal when we want to read. So for that reason, we use a separate device. Indeed, the entries are validated, but that means you never read them from the uh, no. Uh, device. Well, you might read if there is a crash of the booking. Oh, okay, yeah. that's for recovering both of these. Yeah. Okay. So we keep. Uh, I don't know exactly how it works. I think that we we might persist somewhere we are in sync, 
and we might have to read from the journal. Yeah, we read from the journal. And when we think of the measured by the paper mark of the journal, just put the same. Then once you think that's guaranteed that everything that has been in the journal before that mark has been processed from the measured by, so then we can trim the trim the head of the header, the, yeah, the head of the so the interesting thing is that using a journal makes sure that uh, we'll be able to recover if there is a crash in that machine. And by analogy, uh, using Bookkeeper for journaling will guarantee that even if you have, uh, uh, we provide the same guarantees but on a distributed fashion, not only for a single node. Plus here, we this is a single bookie and we have the data is replicated on multiple bookies, so when there is no crash, we recover from the uh,
more capacity, uh, and this will give you already a sufficient performance. I, I really know about how faster the, the DCC uh, hard disks are able to crash this because of their life are, uh, you know, depending on the kind of disk. Uh, but that, that's why you need to yeah. replicate the data. So that's what Wikipedia does. Would it make sense to put uh, several disks on a single node to have, uh, or several disks per node, in order to have uh, faster writes per node? So something like RAID, right? Uh, I don't. I'm not. I'm not a hardware guy, but uh, uh, so this one is the uh, sort the entry log, and this two is the journal, but then. This three is another entry log for disk four, which is also a journal. So yeah. uh, you can yeah yeah. So we have played the idea for you. Uh -huh. yeah. You should actually. And you can double your throughput, but if you just adding on the journal, yeah. Both. So it would mean like yeah. partitioning the journal, like, you know, and uh, but it's probably you know, instead of the the individual. Partition would be the node now, it is a given bookie. Well, we could use something else like uh, having actually multiple disks for a given bookie or multiple bookies on the same node. It, it, yeah. it, it, in, okay. it, it might not be a very good idea because you crash that node, you lose a lot of data, right? Uh -huh. But in, in terms of uh, speeding up each of the nodes, uh, yeah. I, I just I was just curious. Mm -hmm. But then again, you also mentioned that uh, currently the, the network on a gigabit. Uh, yeah, that, would be, is, that can be a problem. Also. But on the, the again, it depends on the network. It depends on like, the terms of the disk.